Hey everyone, happy Friday if you happen to be here in Asia Pacific and um, happy Thursday if you're in the Americas in the evening and happy, I don't know, happy uh, whatever day it is for you in um, wherever you are in the world. I'm uh, unfortunately here on my own. I was supposed to be doing this with my colleague um, and co-host, but unfortunately she's been unwell. And last week we were meant to do it, but uh, we lost power. So the powers that be are just never going to let us um, have this working. And this is the first time we've done a LinkedIn Live here in Asia Pacific. Uh, and first time I've done it with um, the Asia Pacific team for Data Robot. I've got Shirley on chat with me. Shirley, I hope you don't mind me mentioning. Um, but just let me know if everything looks okay. And I would love to know if people are online, they're hearing us okay. Use the chat as usual in the LinkedIn live stream. I want to make sure that that's working because I don't like doing this sitting here all lonesome. But I've got a really exciting um, session for you. So um, I'm going to uh, get started um, and let you know about what I've been up to um, more than anything. And um, would love to see you chatting and I'd love to see you engaging um, across the various social platforms. And uh, it's really exciting to be doing this in my own time zone, not at five o'clock in the morning. So. Um, Happy Friday for everyone. Um, I've had the most amazing day so far. I caught up with um, a guy called Rich Nanda, who's a consultant at Deloitte. Um, and we had a conversation this morning. He wrote a book called The Transformation Myth, um, and which is a great book if you haven't um, already read um, any of it or seen it. Um, and the conversation we had is we were talking about where data is going. Hey, Lisha, thanks for saying hello. Um, I was rambling away there on my own and I thought it was just me and I wanted to see if someone else was there. So I appreciate you saying hello. Carlos, how are you? Hey, if you guys are listening, let me know which city you're in. Where are you? Are you in Melbourne? Uh, Tokyo, Naomi, my dream city to go to again. I haven't been there for a long time and um, I would really like to get back there. So thank you for joining. I hope I'm not speaking too fast. I do have a habit of talking too quickly. If anyone else is on, please let me know. Um, what I am going to do, I was just going to do a preempt of what I did this morning because I got really enlightened this morning, like really, really powerfully enlightened in my conversation because we were talking about data-driven organizations and how you go from not being a data-driven organization to being like at the other end of the scale. New Jersey, wow, that's awesome. Lisha, is it sort of late for you now? Um, Singapore... Can't wait to go back there too. Um, so good to see Singapore online. So we've got like New Jersey, we got Tokyo. Carlos, where are you at? Are you still on? Uh, let me know which city you're dialing in from. If there's any other people on there, let me know. I love city shout outs because it makes me feel like I'm traveling around the world with you. Um, what I'm doing today, California. Awesome. Anna, how are you? Um, and we've got China on as well. Vivian, great to have you on as well. So wow, we got the US, we got Australia, we got... Uh, we've got California, we've got New Jersey, we've got Tokyo, we've got, oh my God, Bradley in New England. I used to live in Boston, Massachusetts. Oh my God. Melbourne, Australia. Um, you can't hear me. Can everyone else hear me okay? Hopefully you're hearing me okay. My dog's scratching at the door. Um, let me know if it's coming through. I'd hate for the audio to, uh, to not be sufficient. Um, now, what I am doing, and it's ironic that, Carlos, you and I are both in Melbourne and you're not hearing me very well. So that's, uh, make sure that's working all right and we'll, we'll see if we can resolve it. Um, what I was going to do today was do a recap of my podcast that I've been working on. Um, I've had the absolute fortune of working with and listening to the most amazing AI keynote speakers. And um, I've got little snippets to show you, little videos. Um, someone said they can hear me okay. Mexico, oh my God, I was only talking last night about how I really want to go back to Mexico. Um, so, hey, Dante, thanks for joining. Um, this isn't going to be a technical session, so if you're, you're really here for technical, then I apologize already. Um, I think Shirley, who's working with me right now, has disclaimers, so she can put them up anytime I get into trouble. But um, this is going to be more of a business overview. Thanks, Anna. Um, that's awesome. And can't wait to come back to California as well. Um, because I was talking about that too. I'm getting really itchy about international travel. So thank you for engaging with me, everyone. I was supposed to be doing this with a co-host and um, I'm an outgoing extra 
extroverted person that loves working with people. So uh, it makes me uh, blessed to be able to to have conversations with you all as um as I'm doing this. And I was explaining about this um this present. Uh, so this is more of a business sort of focus. But what I'm actually doing today is I'm exploring what AI can and will do into the future. I get inspired by it, not the technicalities, not like the different types of algorithms that we're running and the machine learning and the models and these sort of things. And, and if you are that person, that's awesome because you might also learn a little about like what we're sort of talking about when we're having conversations in the boardroom or we're looking at like big picture, blue sky thinking. And that's sort of where I get excited, where I think about where are we going in the future? And in order to understand that, I went and had conversations with people like Max Tegmark. Now, for anyone that hasn't read his book, Life 3.0, I highly recommend it. Hello to Singapore uh, on there as well. Um, I highly recommend this book. Now, I've taken, at this point, I probably should have had a Kindle because I've taken that many notes. Um, and Max is the founder of the Future of Life Institute with Elon Musk, who is a founder of that group. And his purpose is, is actually really interesting. I'm going to play the video actually at this point. I'll see if I can get this work. A little bit of trickery going on today. So I'm going to see if I can make all of this magic work. But let's um, have a quick listen. Um, hey, Jeff, what's going on, man? I just saw a friend of mine who I used to work with. He's uh, joining from Boston, which is awesome. Hey, Jeff, you'll appreciate this and you can maybe ask me, tell me afterwards, but I'm using an ATEM software extreme mini pro whatever to do all this trickery on my own. Um, and I do have the odd audio problems. So... Uh, uh, book, uh, Life 3, I know, but you want to hear from Max Tegmar and hey, Senegal, that's awesome. We got such an awesome international lineup. Have a listen to what Max Tegmark said when I asked him the question, AI will. Let's see if we can get this to work. No. If someone now dies of an uncurable cancer, well, we can figure, it's not scientifically uncurable. We just haven't been smart enough to figure out how to cure it. We can figure out how to lift everybody out of poverty, how to get our act together as a species. And if we feel that uh, this planet is a little too small, it can help us figure out how to help life spread into the cosmos as well. So there's literally, not even the sky is the limit if we get it right. So there's a lot of things to be excited about because the media portray AI almost as evil, but it doesn't have to be that way, does it? No, AI is not evil, nor is it morally good, though. You have to be careful. I think a lot of people are making the mistake of treating tech as their new religion. And they have this mantra that all that more technology is automatically good technology. But technology is a tool, right? A knife can be used to make a great barbecue or it can be used to do really bad stuff. It's the same with AI, except it's so much more powerful than a knife. So it's all going to come down to what we do with it. And the reason I said it could be the worst thing ever is for the same reason, right? The really nastiest stuff that humankind has done, we did with our intelligence. That's why we have caught, killed a lot more than uh, tigers have, right? So if we get these superhuman powers, it's not at all unthinkable that one or a very few people people could just use that to dominate the whole planet. Imagine your least favorite leader and then imagine that they just take over the planet with future AI tech, you know, how does that feel? And it might get even worse. We're in charge right now, we humans of this planet because we're smarter than the tigers and the other animals. If we make something even smarter than us, there's no guarantee that we won't even lose control and we might just get wiped out the same way that we wiped out the Neanderthals. Max Tegmark and um, his book is a fascinating one. So if you get the opportunity to have a read, he does start out with this whole like, where will AI take us? And I am also going to preempt this with saying, I'm going to bring this back to today. I'm going to bring this back to the enterprise and have conversation. Uh, the next person I'm going to talk about is Trisha Wong. who's going to bring it back to the reality of like, where are we today? And um, in doing that and in, in sort of just thinking about what Max was saying, some of the premise of the book, it starts out with this like future, like where do we want to be in the future? What do we want the world to look like? How do we distribute the wealth? How do we stop AI from taking over everything? How do we do AI for good? And so his point was AI will either be the best thing 
or the worst thing that ever happens to us. And I like to believe that everyone who's probably on this stream and everyone that's working at Data Robot and everyone that works in AI is working for the cause to make it a better use and a better world where we cure cancer and, um, and we educate our children better than we have before. We learn musical instruments, we learn languages, we become more empathetic, we have more time more time, I know that's really difficult for all of us to understand, more time to do the things that we really love to do. And um, the premise with this book and, and our podcast, when we had a conversation with him, I really encourage you to listen to him, is to have a listen to, um, to, to what he has to say. And what he's saying is we all play a role. And actually, this comes back to the conversation I had this morning. So I met a guy this morning, uh, Rich Nanda, who's a consultant at Deloitte. We talked about Perth, Western Australia. How's your Awesome, mate. I'm from Perth. So uh, hopefully you're enjoying the fortress over there. And hey, Ben, I'm glad you're liking this, loving it even. And keep the chats coming, guys. I'm really appreciating it. Um, time is the ultimate currency, Ben. And th it's all about urgency. And actually, I'd pull you into this conversation right now if I knew how to do that. But let's just hold for a sec. Um, on a scale of zero to 10, I said, where are we? Where are we with the organizations that are data-driven, insight-driven organizations? Zero to 10 on your scale of the people you're dealing with, what is the average? And he said, ah, I'm not even going to say it. What do you think? What do you guys on the chat think? What on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being they are the ultimate data-driven, insight-driven AI-powered organization that is agile and adapting to everything. 10 is the ultimate. Zero is we're nowhere near it. What's the scale out there? What do we all think? That, and it doesn't have to represent your own company. I was in the three to four. He said two. The exciting... Bradley's saying six at best. Yeah, I don't... I don't disagree. And it depends on your, your scale, right? It depends on who you're working for. Um, and hello, David at Peru. Great name, David. Um, but what I've come to realize is two to five from, um, from Lisha. Thank you, Lisha, for that. Um, I'm going to chuck that one up there on the screen. So nice work. Um, four, five. So we're all in pretty good consensus, right? And we're probably also a little bit biased because we work in this industry and so we're we're sort of at the forefront or we're probably working for companies that are at the forefront of um being insight driven or wanting to be there what's stopping us from getting to 10 what what do you guys think is the limitation that stops us and i had this very conversation today in a podcast because the technology is there and the technology will always evolve. So maybe we can't always get to 10, but we can always be like seven or eight. Generally, across, and, and Lisha, that's a good comment. Generally across different industries, it should be two to five on a scale of 10. Yeah, because the technology still does have to evolve, right? It's still a little bit in its infancy. And so we still need to learn how to adopt it, how to use it. Culture will exactly, Dante, the next word out of my mouth, culture we're never going to get 100% because of culture because there'll be blockers, there'll be people that aren't bought in, there are people that will stay with the way that they work. Sometimes it's also not necessarily that person's fault. It hasn't. The leadership hasn't communicated it to them. Their um, KPIs or OKRs aren't aligned to where um, the rest of the organization is and maybe that's for a particular reason because... We're quarter in, quarter out, just needing to deliver and we're not keeping an eye on the future. That's the conversation I had today, but I it did come back today and I got so inspired. It made me think about, I love sport. And so it made me think about like exercise, right? We all know we need to exercise or we should exercise because it's good for us. Why don't we do it? Because other things get in the way. We have other priorities. We Sometimes we feel unwell and we can't do it. Sometimes we prioritize other things. Sometimes we just don't like it. And that's probably pretty similar to where we're at with like my idea of a data-driven organization is different to your idea of a data-driven organization and, and what we need to achieve. And um, Steve's saying two out of 10. So thanks for sharing with that. And anyone that's just picking up and joining the conversation, we were doing a scale of zero out of 10 for the organizations that are data-driven and those and insight-driven. I don't mean just we're collecting the data, but we're actually making predictive decision-making based on the data that we've collected and... Um, 
And what's stopping us from getting there in culture, I think, was number one because it's not technology, but it's also urgency. Like, because you get that moment of excitement where you're like, I, I'm going to do this. I am going to do this. And, and I'm not going to knock everyone out of the way. But the other thing that he said is that it takes leadership. It takes someone to come in and instigate that change. And I think the, the most exciting thing for me, and this is the stuff that in this podcast, and I'm going to talk about Trisha Wong next. We're only at the start of like, we think that the transformation, and I don't think, I know you guys don't agree with this as well, but we're not at the start, we're not even at the close to the start of where uh, we are at the start. We're not at the, close to the end of where transformation. Hey, um, Mr. Jack in Malaysia, hopefully I pronounced that okay. So by the way, uh, amazing international audience. Thank you everyone for, for um, being on here and, and joining the chat. And I'm, I'm hoping that you're enjoying the conversation that we're having, <laughs> me with myself, but I'm enjoying chatting to you and getting inspired because I'm very inspired today to, um, to of where we're going to go. Doesn't this excite you? This is why I joined Data Robot because I got excited about where is machine learning and augmented intelligence going to take us? And we're just at the dawn of this, even cloud technologies, the applications all still aren't in the cloud. We still haven't quite got our grip and hands around everything. Um, Sean Planky was awesome, wasn't he, Jeremy? Um, I don't know if you listened to that, but we're definitely getting him back on. And in fact, all of the guests that I've spoken to on the podcast recently all want to do a LinkedIn Live. This is the only session where I'm doing it on my own um, because my co-host was sick, unfortunately. Um, I'm going to do a shout out for that one there from Harjot. Um, our future is a race between the growing power of technology such as AI and the wisdom with which we use it. That. Well, that hits home, right? Because 20 years ago, didn't we have this um, prediction? Maybe it was longer than that, that we were going to work less than we've ever worked. We were going to have more leisure time. We we're going to spend more time with the kids doing the things that we love. Yep, we got more time spent with the kids last year, that's for sure. And this year, it's because of COVID, but not because we made technological decisions where the machines were working for us and we were able to, to, to give time. And, and it was funny... In this conversation today with Rich, I said, what do you think then is as AI and machine learning matures and, and we mature with using it, do you think we'll get time back? Well, can we invent a three-day weekend? And he's like, no, because the people that are at the heart of this are passionate about new technologies and they'll continue to explore. We're like explorers that go on missions and we'll just continue to do it and we'll become increasingly passionate about it. But the key about how we use this technology is how we're going to use it for medical, how we'll use it to improve our work uh, in what we do so we get decisions instead of having to, to manually do you know um, mining data and these sort of things and we can actually start to add value back to the business. Now I'm going to transition right because Max Tegmark was probably one of my favorite people that we had a conversation with because it was big picture and um, it made me really think about the future of society and where are we heading and there's some pretty dark stuff in there but basically the emphasis is it's on us. It's on all of us because there are no rules. There's no one that are governing it. I don't even think our governments yet have a full grasp on, on um, how society will take advantage of AI or potentially um, cause conflict with it. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of throw that one out there. It's a really cool podcast if you get an opportunity to listen to Max Tegma. He happened to live in Winchester, uh, where I lived in Boston, which was hilarious because I recognized his house when I was on the podcast and I was like, where do you live? And then we happened to have a conversation about swans and I said, have those cygnets when I was living there, have they, are they, have they grown now? And he was like, yeah, yeah. And he had to show me and took me outside and showed me the swans. So nature is awesome. Now, the next person I'm having a conversation with is Trisha Wong. She doesn't have a book, um, but she is absolutely remarkable. And her, for her, it's not about just the data. It's actually about the stories you tell with the data. And of all the podcasts that relate to an enterprise perspective, I think Trisha Wong's is the best. Now I'm going to try my trickery again and see if I can get Trisha. Um, she's not going to be on, but you're going to see a little snippet of her video right now. 
I would say big data is one thing, quantitative data, numbers, that sh data that shows up in a database because, but in order to make numbers show up in a spreadsheet or in database, I don't care how big your database is, it's the same thing as just a fancy spreadsheet. You have to normalize, you have to standardize and you have to cluster, you have to do all those things to clean the data to show up in a spreadsheet or a large warehouse so that you can use it in that lake, right? That's quantitative data. There's a whole other set of data that I call thick data, which is just qualitative data. It's data that comes in the form of stories. It's, it's tears, it's smiles. It's those things that don't fit in a spreadsheet. That's just as much, that's data too. So thick data. So these are like, uh, uh, it was hard for me to get her, my head around thick data. So if you've not seen Trisha Wong's TED talk, I highly recommend it. Um, a database is a fancy spreadsheet. Um, if, if you haven't seen her presentation, it's really, really fascinating because the, her whole premise, where she learned this, was she was working at Nokia. And when she was working at, and, and also give me a shout out if you've seen this um, Trisha Wong's uh, TED talk, because then I won't recap too much of it. But the premise was she was working at, at Nokia and she's an ethnographer, a data ethnographer. So she was going around understanding stories of how people are using data. And she went and lived in China. And in China, she started to recognize what was going on with the new iPhone. And so the iPhone was coming out and we all know the story, right? So Nokia was the leader with their, with their smart, well, it wasn't even a smartphone. It was with their phone. I all had, I had a, what, a Nokia 3210, 6110, something like that. Even the banana one out of the matrix. And with a last name like Anderson, Mr. Anderson, I've been expecting you. Yes, the banana flip phone. I had to get one of those. Um, I digress. She was reporting back to Nokia and she was saying, the smartphone's coming. In China, people were mimicking the phones. They were creating fake copies of it. She just saw this movement, this cultural wave. And when she went back to Nokia, she said, it, it's not going to be these phones anymore. It's going to be this smartphone. It's going to revolutionize. It's going to take over the world. And Nokia says, our data doesn't show us that because the data they were looking at was data that didn't exist. That was the point. The point is data will tell you one thing and it will tell you a lot of what you need to know and you can make great decisions with it, but you have to balance that data with the stories, with what people are saying about certain features, functions, products, the smiles, the fears, these sort of things. Um, Bradley, nice down under shout out for Hugo. Um, I'm not sure what that means. Is that anyway? But I like the chat. I like that you're um you're chatting on here. So uh, keep the chat up, Brad. I really appreciate it. Um, now a couple of other things on Trisha before um I f finish up because it's I'm nearly at the end already. I'm having so much fun. I could keep going a little bit longer, but it really is up to you if you want to stick around and hear me keep going. Um, the other thing that was so critical with what uh. Trisha was saying, and she gave an example, I nearly grabbed my guitar, was that she told a story about Fender versus Gibson. And, uh, ah, Mr. Anderson. Ah, uh, Hugo Weaving. All right, I got it. I got it, Brad. You're like too... Yeah, you get it. But, uh, Mr. When I watched The Matrix and that scene happened, I was remember sitting in the movies and I can't remember how old I was, but I just remember going, Mr. Anderson, we've been expecting you. I went, I am never ever going to live this down ever again hey vj thanks for joining from china um amazing international audience and i'm not just talking about uh hugo weaving yeah impersonation from matrix got it lincoln brad love it um yeah never lived it down i was like oh my god i like really i couldn't concentrate on the rest of the movie because i was like oh everyone as soon as you go out of the movie theater it becomes a cult film don't please don't become a cult film oh yeah yep it's gonna become a cult film everywhere i go oh mr anderson we've been expecting you ah whatever embrace it um uh, I won't tell the Fender Gibson story now. I can't be bothered. It's a good one. Basically, Fender was a uh, short version. Fender, instead of just pulling the data, they pulled their data of what they needed to do. But what they also did is they gathered stories. In gathering stories, they tried to identify who their market was, who are their new buyers and what do they want. Gibson, on the other hand, did no research, did, did nothing really, basically just went, everyone wants to be a rock star. And, and that's it. And so they just marketed towards guys wanting to be rock stars, which was not the new audience. The new audience actually, and Fender recognized this, 
is a younger female audience that want to learn to play guitar. And they developed, obviously, the Fender app. And if there's any guitarists out there who have ever used the Fender app, it's absolutely amazing. I'm a dad of two girls who both aspire to play guitar. Their ads now, if you look around, are a lot of younger females learning to play guitar using the app. And I just think it's a great example of like the data didn't quite exist for them yet. They went out, they found stories. Naturally, they do their market research. And then they can start to weave that data into how they go to market. Now, what else have I got? Um, presentation overload from Trisha Wong is a classic one. Um, and uh, as we develop more data, I just thought this was kind of funny to add in. And then I'm going to do one more funny one to finish. So let's have a listen to Trisha on, um, on how awesome it is to have so much of this data in our world. A lot of organizations are looking for quick fixes. They want, like, like you said, a quick answer. And what we find is that all of these data, like... For some reason, we have more dashboards, but we ha we don't have less PowerPoints. Like mm -hmm. I ask every C-suite leader, this like, do you actually have less PowerPoints in the in right now than you did before? Like now that we have more dashboards for you to look at, and no, it's like dashboards are just like being like people are just screenshotting or exporting their dashboards to put into more PowerPoints, and then just shit gets piled up where someone's like, give me a PowerPoint, and then they the, the junior person makes it, sends it back, and be like, oh no, we need this, and it gets so politicized, and then everyone is like so obsessed with making PowerPoints as opposed to like actually learning how to communicate with data about people. Another cool, uh, another cool story, right? And that's the point of what she's talking about is because we often get wrapped up in all of the PowerPoint presentations that we're doing, and I don't know if this is 100% true, and I said this on that podcast, um, I don't think Amazon, when they have meetings with Jeff Bezos or when they did, they don't share PowerPoint presentations. They have to come in, they have to know their data and they have to tell stories on where they're going. And I just think that's an example of like, if you're an up and coming um, executive or you're an up and coming you know, data scientist, marketing manager, whatever that might be, it's so critical to not just present the information, but actually be able to tell a story about that information about that data that you're presenting and what your theory behind it is and how you got to where those answers are and that's why it's really important from an ai perspective to understand and have explainable ai that you can actually explain well this is how this is where a bias could come in this is how it was calculated and therefore these are my assumptions and then you go and test those assumptions i cannot believe I can talk underwater. Well, I think you guys have all recognized this, but I've had the most remarkable opportunity to interview some fantastic people. The podcast is called Tech Seeking Human. If you were going to listen to any of them, you would listen to those first two. Trisha Wong and Max Tegmark are probably my favorites, but there's also people like Gene Kim, who's a friend of mine and um, remarkable. And there's another book um, that I highly recommend, which is Team of Teams. Um, it's been referenced now in three different books that I've been reading. So um, it's the importance of continuous um, dynamic learning, cross collaboration and autonomous decision making where you enable more people to make decisions so that you can scale. And if you think that they can do it in the US military, they can pretty much do it anywhere. And the example of that is really like a rigid organization. Now, one more funny one before we finish off, right? Because we talk about trust and making decisions with AI. Some of the people that I've met are AI experts, right? So they understand the bias that comes with AI. And in this podcast, I was talking to Ellen Broad, who's an Australian AI. Um, she wrote a fantastic book as well. Uh, a lot of it had to do with bias. A lot of it has to do with AIs developed by humans that, and then it's subject to the bias that that developer has worked on and we're not quite mature yet. So we spent 40 minutes talking about that. And then at the very end, Ellen says this, which absolutely blew my mind. I hope you um, see if I've got the right one. I've got this written twice. So if it's the kangaroo one, that's just as funny, but um, it's about AI getting it wrong. Let's just see which one we get. Let's have a go. Yeah. Lucky we've got smart people out there like you because most of us aren't the most intelligent beings. I am still as gullible as anybody else. In fact, I keep saying with book number two, I'll have to tell the story of how I got pregnant with Jean by accident because I started using digital, a digital app that was allegedly predicting 
when I would be ovulating, uh, and now there are court cases against these uh, apps because they were luring women into thinking oof. that, well, you know, what is being predicted about your body is actually what's happening in your body. And I study this for a living, and yeah. yet I used it for three months and got pregnant by accident because <laughs> I just had convinced myself that, oh, look, oh, the app says. That's good. I'm Imagine the app that, review. Sorry. You're going to give it totally... zero stars. I'm having a baby because your app sucks. <laughs> I'm not going to mention it, but you know, like we're all guilty yeah. of going, oh, this like, you know, in my case, it was like, I want to get, this felt weirdly more natural, you know, like you're not using hormones, you're not taking the pill. Yeah. It's like using data. <laughs> it's got to so, be right. <laughs> <laughs> so you wrote the book on like, make decisions, don't necessarily trust the AI. And now you're having a baby because of the AI. That was Baby number one. I had the baby. Oh, that was the first <laughs> one. Let me be clear. I We've only made on, one mistake. We've only made one. I only made one mistake. I only had one child. Amazing, right? I just absolutely couldn't believe it and um, thought it was hilarious and uh, true story. And she didn't necessarily want to share it, but we all make mistakes with data because we make the wrong assumptions and we've got to make sure that our predictions are right and you got to test. And I guess when it comes to having a baby, there's not much you can do about it. But uh, thankfully, she's a wonderful mom and had a healthy baby. And um, just a funny part of the conversations that we've had when we've done these podcasts. Um, the other one, I won't share it because we're, we're sort of out of time, but um, it's about... AI and machines learning and having to like, you would keep going on about how smart AI is. And I think we all can attest that it's, it's, it's not as smart as where it needs to be yet. Like we're getting there and we're getting ways, obviously naturally through companies like Data Robot, where we can automate more so we can sort of spend more time understanding the data and sort of tweaking it and making sure our models are right. Um, one of the great examples, she should publish an article about that, Charity. I 100% agree. She said she's probably going to put it in her next book. So maybe we shouldn't tell everyone too much about it. Although I think it's absolutely hilarious. Um, she told, actually, there's two other stories in that podcast. That's, this is Ellen Broad, right? The other one was about our trust in reviews. So uh, this one guy set up a fake restaurant in the UK, I'm trying to think of the suburb it was in, he got all these reviews, he put out like fake tables and took photos and created a movement of like, and it got voted, somehow it got voted like the best restaurant in, um, in the UK. And people were turning up to the suburb, coming off the tube saying, do you know where this restaurant is? And the restaurant doesn't exist. And in the end, the person that did the fake reviews decided to actually create a restaurant. And all he was doing was heating up frozen meals and giving it to people. And people were believing that the food was amazing because of the reviews. And it just kind of blew my mind as to like, how gullible can we be? And how influenced are we by reviews and, and these sort of things? And so I just thought, um, Marius, uh, to that point, I don't know if you were saying it was unbelievable, the story about the restaurants or unbelievable because of um, having a baby because of uh, trusting an AI. But um, she did go on to say that that company, I think, is in a little bit of trouble because um, obviously <laughs> their algorithm doesn't work. Um, then the last part, the last part about trust. So we we're talking about autonomous vehicles and these sort of things. So the other part in her book, it talks about how Volvo had to come out and admit that it uh, has trouble detecting kangaroos. So, because uh, you obviously naturally, like every AI that you develop, you develop for permutations, right? But I'm sure the Swedish, when they were developing their autonomous vehicle and the software that they were developing, they weren't thinking about how kangaroos behave. I'd be really interested actually to know. We have Teslas here. I'd be really interested to know whether Tesla can account for a kangaroo. If anyone's has seen it, I'm going to look it up after this straight away and see whether um, there are any kangaroos and, and, whether, and for anyone who doesn't live in Australia, we don't have kangaroos just jumping wildly across any of the streets. But if you do drive 
you know, an hour out of the city, you can come across a kangaroo. And the thing is, they like a deer, you know, you say deer in a headlights, but they come bounding across. They're so fast. And so it's very difficult. And obviously, naturally, Volvo had to update their algorithm to, to, uh, to, uh, to figure out how kangaroos worked. Hey, so guys, I started this off going like, what am I going to talk about today? I've had a wonderful time talking to you all. Thank you for joining in. It's really made um, my lunchtime today to get some engagement with you all. If there's one thing that I've learned today that I really encourage you to take away, um, that's the importance of like anything is possible. So, and I truly believe that anything is possible. We're at the dawn of like the most remarkable opportunity that we've ever had and you just have to think back to like where were you when the cloud was first coming and what did you do to take advantage of it and you and your team for that matter or your company if you run a company and where were you when you first heard about mobile phones coming in and the difference it was going to make and and where we were going with it and and now we're sort of at this dawn of like well so where are we now with AI and machine learning and where will it be and it's really it's this opportunity because um, I have these slides and I, I used to always show them. I'm not even, I won't even bother pulling them up, but I always go like, you have one of the hardest jobs in the world working in technology, dealing with the new cloud environments and hyper dependencies and algorithms and data output and the importance of being data driven and keeping up with technology. But also with that, you now also have one of the greatest opportunities of all time because you are sitting right at the core of where every company wants to be. You're in the engine room and in that engine room, you almost see everything. And so you have the most remarkable opportunity in the next five, 10 years to accelerate your career, to build amazing teams, to do awesome outputs, to turn your organization into a data-driven, insight-driven, nine out of 10. I'm never going to get 10, are we? nine out of 10 organization. And um, I really look forward to hearing more stories with you all, having you join more chats. I, hopefully, I'm going to come back and do more of these if you enjoy them. Please let me know and, and look me up on LinkedIn if you haven't already and connect with me and send me a personal note if you enjoyed the chat today. I would love feedback. I continually try and get better as I do these presentations. Check out the podcast. It's Tech Seeking Human. Um, it's available on all those social platforms as well as YouTube. And um, everyone, have a wonderful uh, Thursday night into Friday. Have a fantastic weekend. Stay safe, everyone. And um, thanks so much, everyone, for joining. And hopefully, I will see you again in the not-too-distant future. Please uh, drop and give me a note and say hi. Thanks again, everyone. Have a great weekend.